Hello, everybody. Very warm welcome to today's event at CSDS. We are delighted to have with us Professor Dr. Bhavani Raman. She teaches and is also currently chairing at the Historical and Cultural Studies Department at the University of Toronto. Um, we know of her, all of us know of her first book, which was a mega hit. Uh, document Raj, which talked about uh, how in the early co company years, uh, the idea of documentary accountability of administration, law, property, and so on, changed the nature of what we understand as modern power. Um, she uh, is uh, also a chair of the Tamil World Initiative. Uh, program, uh, programming, yeah, uh, a tri-campus program. She has very little on the website. So this is all investigative stuff. And if I'm wrong, tell me. Um, I read a very interesting uh, essay by her uh, recently on uh, Tamil studies, decolonizing Tamil studies. Uh, so she's also involved in generating sense of a field um, which is language based in which in CSDS we're extremely interested in language worlds. Um, so she, I mean, I don't want to go on and on. She studied in Stephens, JNU and Michigan uh, and is now a professor and a well-known scholar. I will just hand over to Bhavani and we are really, really happy that you could be here and in person. Thank you, Bhavani. Uh, Pratima, thank you. That was a very generous uh, uh, introduction, considering that I gave you no information. And, and I have to say, I'm not the chair of my department, thank goodness. Um, but I am very happy to be here. And I want to uh, begin my talk by actually expressing my solidarity for the JNU students who are trying to keep the DSA library open on campus. Um, that library was a very important space for students. It was an important space for me when I was a student. And I really hope the administration is able to listen to what the students are saying. Um, so in my talk today, I want to share a small piece of research, um, a part that I am uh, presenting today as part of a book that I'm trying to write about uh, the origins of security laws in modern India. And um, it's been a book that's taken a long time coming together. And partly I think it was because of, you know, various things happen uh, when you become a teacher and uh, you start, you know, taking responsibilities in departments and so on. But I think partly it was also um, a problem with how I had been thinking about the colonial archive. And so the bulk of today's talk is, I think, just channelizing all the difficulties I had, I tried to channelize it into a paper and I'm hoping that we can have a discussion about how one does archival research on security laws, why might we want to do so, um, how might that change, perhaps the way we think about security and security laws, uh, what might be the connection between seeming resonances through time periods, but also the distinct, distinct formation of security in particular time periods. So I'm going to ask uh, for the screen share to come because I have a few images that I want to share. I think I might ask you to uh, turn the slide, you know, yeah. Now just go back to the first one, sorry, because it's not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So in my talk today, I want to share the forgotten history of a contentious legal innovation of our modern age, which is preventive detention. Preventive detention empowers the executive government to detain persons without trial for significant or indefinite periods of time in the name of national or public security. The detention anticipates the commission of a harmful act. Um, it's not post a crime, right? It's before a crime is committed. 
In short, preventive detention fractures the constitutional protections of liberty of person, movement, and access to due process. For this reason, preventive detention is highly debated in legal circles. And in India, these debates have focused on 20th century histories from the late colonial wartime laws of preventive detention to its challenge by A.K. Gopalan versus State of Madras, which was heard by the Supreme Court in 1940. The story I want to share is about preventive detention from several decades before that, from the early 19th century, from an area called Ghumsar in the Ganjam Agency in what was then Madras Presidency and what is now Odisha. The history of the long Gumsha rebellions against the East India Company, led by military lords and Adivasi societies, is well documented by Odisha's historians of anti-colonialism and anti-colonial nationalism. But legal historians have yet to connect Gumsha to the origins of the first freestanding law of preventive arrest, and this is Bengal Regulation 3, 1818. So if you are somewhat familiar with security laws, especially colonial security laws concerning sedition and so on, you will be familiar with this law because it keeps popping up. By connecting these two histories, I will explore two things. First is the relationship between historical amnesia and legal authority. How is amnesia produced by the media archives of law, by citation, metadata, recording, that erases the context that would otherwise undermine the symbolic order of law? Second, what might we learn about national security laws and preventive detention in particular by assembling the by reassembling a ghost dossier of Bengal 1818? So you know what in, in so there are two things going on, right? One is the imperial uh, context for this regulation, and second is its disappearance in plain sight. Okay, at the next slide, why do the context of laws formulation matter? And how are they forgotten? Cornelia Wisman, who is a media theorist, has argued that deleting rather than writing establishes a symbolic order of law. The symbolic order of the law is produced when the law, she said, emancipates itself from the file. That is when the word of a law is disconnected from the media, its documents, their form and discussions that led to its framing. This disconnect between law and its record room has prevented us from historicizing security laws such as preventive detention in phenomenological terms. Protocols of writing, archiving, and researching, you might say, have disappeared, Gumsar, as one important site for the law of preventive retention in plain sight. To work against this archival disappearance allows, requires us to reconstruct a disappeared body of files by working against the archival protocols that territorially organize paper into provincial, national, and imperial collections in the state archive. By assembling preventive detention's coast dossier, I hope to situate the state version of preventive detention in its social and legal contexts. Taking a cue from feminist legal scholarship, and here I'm really thinking about the work of Pratiksha Bakshi, I want to understand the, um, the law in relationship to the custodial power that was exercised in the non-state domain, that is by the household. So I want to kind of juxtapose state narratives of custody and non-state narratives of custody. Bengal 3, 1818, I think, appropriated forms of abduction familiar to patriarchal households and to early modern alliance building for public law in the name of public security. Now, my focus on regulations, households, and abduction might sound a bit strange at first at glance because preventive detention, of course, as we know, is associated with a fictionalized understanding of wartime. The most famous uh, example, uh, the theorist who, who's often quoted on this, is Agamben, Jojo Agamben, who writes of the Prussian juridical institution of protective custody. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, protective custody or Schutzkraft, widely used in, the Nazi, in Nazi Germany and derived from the 1851 declaration of the state of siege. So Schutzkraft, um, Agamben argues, provided the juridical basis of the camp when under the Nazis, the state of exception ceased to be referred to a provin provin provisional state of factual danger and came to be confused with the juridical rule uh, of law itself. Consider that the Cons Constituent Assembly of India exempted preventive detention from Article 22. And at that time, uh, it was Article 15 in the draft version, which protects individuals against arrest and detention in 1949. This exemption inscribed preventive detention within juridical rule. But I think it comes from a long history of blurring regulation and significant moments of actually judicial pushback. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? 
Um, indeed, as scholars of late colonial India have shown, freestanding laws were amply used to detain dissenters in their thousands in the 1930s. This is also when there was a legal pushback against these statutory pro provisions against um, executive power. And we know this from the scholarship of Rohit Day and Arudra Bura. 10 years later in the 1940s, political detainees won cases against their illegal detention in Bombay, Patna, Allahabad, and Madras high courts against an aggressive provincial public safety measures act promulgated by Congress governments. A robust civil liberties movement in India in the 40s had shaped this legal arena, drawing from the concerns of labor and working class movements as Kalyani Ramnath has shown. The tussle between this judicial uh, discussion and judicial pushback and executive power laid the ground for independent India's constitutional debates and the 1950 preventive detention law. In November 1948, can I have the next slide please? The Madras High Court gave a temporary reprieve to the Indian communist A.K. Gopalan, who had been detained for his anti-police speeches. Calling the detention illegal, Judge K. Subarao wrote, and I quote, now that we have attained freedom, it is the sacred duty of this court to see that no citizen of this province, whether he is rich or poor, whether he belongs to this, that political persuasion is illegally detained even for one minute, close quote. It was in response to this judicial pushback that India's home minister, Vallabhai Patel, introduced the statutory law of preventive detention. The day after the law was passed, the Times of India reported that the union government's so-called emergency legislation had become, and I quote, urgently inevitable in view of certain judicial decisions and a crop of litigation in various states. So the point I really want to make here is that this is a discussion between the executive and the judicial, uh, um, uh, the trial and the judicial discussion of such laws. Regulation 3, 1818 is the earliest freestanding provision of administrative detention in the world. It is at best a footnote in the literature. And the law is called Bengal Regulation 3, 1818, a regulation for the confinement of state prisoners. This regulation empowered governors and the governor general of the British East India Company to detain individuals as state prisoners indefinitely without trial. Whereas, declared the preamble, and I can have the next slide, please. Thank you. For reasons of state, embracing the due maintenance of the alliances formed by the British government with foreign powers, the preservation of tranquility in the territories of native princesses entitled to its protection, and the security of the British dominion from foreign hostility and internal commotion occasionally render it necessary to place under personal restraint individuals against whom they may not be sufficient ground to institute any judicial proceeding, or when such proceeding may not be adapted to the nature of the case, or may for other reasons be unadvisable or improper." Close quote. So it seems when you look at this preamble, the foundations of internal government were laid in, the highly, in a highly variated political system by legitimizing state abduction as law. Assembling the absent file. Archival documents pertaining to preventive detention are unusual in their brevity. The courtroom is of course conspicuously absent since there was no trial. So to my initial frustration, I could not find the immediate reason for why Bengal 3, 1818 was promulgated. The absent dossier of preventive detention is a particular challenge. The disappeared body of the detainee seemed to me to be mirrored in the disappeared file. If there was no paper cadaver for regulation 1880 to exhume, then what kind of autopsy could I as a historian undertake? How could one assemble a ghost dossier for this law? I suffered from archival fever. And at first, any number of locations and possibilities appeared to me as a feasible scene for regulation 3, 1818. And, you know, I've been talking to some scholars similarly engaged in this process, and it is really it becomes an obsession because you really can't find it. Yet many years of reading colonial administrative documents made me feel that the tone of Regulation 3, 1818 did not quite fit the language of the suppression of a revolt. May I have the next slide, please? The key phrase that the regulation um, is that the key phrase, it seemed to me, is that the regulation allowed the company to detain individuals against whom there wasn't sufficient ground to institute any judicial proceeding. That is, a conflict was underway clearly between the company's courts of justice and the company's executive government. A conflict that has been described by Mithi Mukherjee as one between a supranational de-territorial imperial justice that was critical of a colonial governance model driven by territorial conquest and subjugation. But what the preamble also clarified was that the quest for imperial paramountcy could not proceed without closing down the courts. 
at the time of its greatest expansion, the company did not enjoy a monopoly on justice nor on the bearing of arms. Next slide, please. Custody. The company could not be, and this is the, I've just put the quote on just so that you can see um, exactly why I felt reading the preamble again and again. And I think I just read that preamble for several years before I realized, okay, this is, this is the kind of tension uh, in the language of the law. Can I have the next slide, please? The company could not claim to be a legal sovereign of India. It needed the bells of justice in two senses. The performative theater of the adversarial trial was essential to its colonial authority. Its criminal courts called the Adalat were not spaces where English law was practiced, but relied on the interpretive powers of Muslim law officers of the Hanafi school. Beyond the Adalat, there were other courts as well. There were special military courts to try rebels when martial law was declared, special treason courts, and residents of the presidency cities could access the king's justice at its supreme courts. Significantly, the idea of a just sovereign was also a popular expectation, and this compelled the company to keep its courts open. Ethical traditions from the principles of Niti to Islamic ideals watered ideas of justice and governance for centuries in South Asia. The early modern period under the Mughals had seen the wide circulation of Islamic ideas of the circle of justice, a virtue-based orientation to the use of power that adhered to justice called Adalat, prosperity fairs, and felicity or ifal. Mughal imperial subjects, whether Hindu or Muslim, invoked these principles to call sovereigns to account and to call for justice when they were wronged. So this is an image from the Todd um, uh, archive, and it just shows you, you know, many of these images are often seen as, um, as the kind of the early phase of uh, the Raj where um, the, the European officer takes on the dress and the symbols of, of uh, Indian, in, Indian sovereignty. Um, so what I kind of I'm trying to sort of suggest by using this image in my presentation is to sort of think about some of the pressures that were coming in terms of the ethical uh, context in which um, and the, the ideas of sovereign justice that the company had to sort of engage with in a substantial way. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is a, a, a slide from the Bombay archive uh, showing images of uh, the muftis, the Malvis, and various law officers who were part of the company Adalat system. Next slide, please. And this is a very famous image, a uh, miniature image of uh, Jahangir pulling uh, the chains of justice, right? uh, uh, installing the chains of justice. One key aspect of this sense of justice was that unreasonable confinement, aka abduction, could imperil sovereign authority. So while abduction of hostages was innate to political alliances in the early modern world and used as a tool of negotiation and ransom, there was a particular tension between the sense of sovereign justice, which you can see in, in the slide before you, and abduction. Already in 1675, the Mughal uh, Emperor Aurangzeb's Farman on justice began with a preface that declared that prolonged detention without trial or evidence as a form of wrongdoing was a form of wrongdoing or oppression, zulm. The emperor warned his provincial administrators in Ahmedabad against delaying investigations and declared that no imperial subject should suffer regret or discrimination and no, none should suffer captivity without reason. Unjust detention was part of uh, political craft and it could imperil imperial sovereign justice. And indeed, this was a tension that became an acute problem for colonial legality when the British began to expand their court system. Compelled to take hostages, they could not deal with them legally. Can I have the next slide, please? For one thing, magistrates found that there was little or no evidence to commit detainees that, had captured, that they had captured for negotiation and ransom. So much so, in 1803, the Madras governor and council asked the judges of the Provincial Court of Appeal whether it was possible, and I quote, to secure the tranquility of the country short of continuing to place persons under undefined restraint, close quote. The tacit advice the governor received was to hold persons for as long as the period of pre-trial detention did not exceed the punishments they received should they be found guilty when tried. So, you know, look at the acrobatics that are put into place in order to, um, you know, keep within the broader strictures of, of, of justice. Another problem was that Islamic law, largely of the Hanafi tradition, which was practiced at the Adalats, recognized the idea of just rebellion and desisted from capital punishment in both public and private criminal law. When the rebels were tried in company courts, they were not necessarily harshly punished with death. So if trying rebels posed a problem, closing the courts as well was not a good option. 
to the zamindars, martial law, the closing of the courts, did not mean a temporary suspension of the law. Rather, troops signaled the permanent end of the company's civil government. The closing of the courts signaled an opportune moment to assert autonomy, liberate detainees from the company's custody, and renegotiate arrears. So the, uh, the interesting thing about this is that while the company was able to detain a lot of people, they constantly had to deal with breaks. Like their associates would come and liberate prisoners consistently. So this was the larger context for Bengal 3, 1818. The most specific incident for the law was a particularly difficult case concerning the detention of a zamindar, Dhananjay Bhanj of Ghumshar of Madras Presidency. Next slide, please. This is Madras Presidency, and this area is Northern Sarkar's, what's called Northern Sarkar, but is now uh, Ganjam district of Odisha. Uh, I can't really point to Ghumshar, but you'll have to think of it somewhere in the upper edges of the plateau. In 1814, Shri Kara Bhanj, um, the deposed zamindar of Ghumshar, accused his son and incumbent, Tananjay, of murder. It always starts with a murder. He alleged that his son had taken a large number of the Ghumshar household, including wives, concubines, and slave girls hostage. He charged his son with murdering his wife, Gauri Patna Mahadevi, in custody. Mr. Woodcock, the magistrate of Ganjam, had been waiting for just such an opportunity to intervene in Ghumshar. For much of the 18th century, the East India Company considered Ghumshar so forested and militarily impenetrable that it had refrained from bringing it under its direct jurisdiction. The allegation of homicide would allow the magistrate to enter the zamindar's residence and intervene in the household. He summoned Dhananjay for inquiry. The prolonged exchange that followed demonstrates the intimacy of law's violence. The magistrate asked the zamindar to appear in front of him if he desired friendship and protection rather than enmity and vengeance. He was, and I quote, obligated to ensure that the law is obeyed so that the innocent and the friendless were not destitute of support. These obligations to law are an inalienable aspect of my British character, close quote. The zamindar's disobedience would be considered resistance to the government. Let the zamindar reflect, wrote Woodcock, and I quote, in a British court of justice, every man may, with the most perfect obedience, look to full patient and impartial hearing, and if innocent, to an early and entire restoration to the same honors, dignities, and comforts as he enjoyed before he appeared in that court." Close quote. So you can see the, no, the kind of uh, negotiation that is at underway in this discussion. The Zamindar rightly suspected that the summons were a ruse to take him hostage and perhaps depose him. He did not argue in terms of Woodcock's law but sought reassurance that the company would protect him from his creditors. While these negotiations were ongoing, Magistrate Woodcock ordered the seizure of Gumshar's estate. A military detachment laid, uh, led by Lieutenant Colonel Fletcher failed to secure the zamindar's person because the zamindar left. Fletcher, however, managed to enter the fort where he discovered corpses and liberated members of the Gumshur's, of the Gumshur household from captivity. Two months later, July 1815, the zamindar surrendered and was detained. The zamindar then appealed, that appealed his illegal detention. He wrote that the company had acted in bad faith. The charge of murder had unfairly deprived him of his country, his estate, and his character. His father's wife, Gauri Patna Mahadevi, was still alive. He had decided to come out of the woods because he believed that his stars had turned. Auspicious omens had appeared before him before undertaking the journey to Ganjam. And I quote, I had faith in the magistrate's cowl, but it was revoked. I was confined without security. They styled me a maje, an ex zamindar close quote. Note how the idea of protection is an obligation was given on paper. In custody, he had protested his injustice by refusing to eat. He now wanted to see the governor in person. The letter vividly illustrates, even in its translation, the sense of unjust custody mediated by a document, a cowl, rather than any straightforward claim to the liberty of persons or on the British end, a neutral criminal procedure. But why did Gumshar arrest or trigger the law of administrative detention? One reason was that the murder trial that fav favored the Zamindar Dhanije, so he wasn't incriminated in the, in the trial. The Islamic law officer in the Adalat court only pronounced the Zamindar to be punished by discretionary punishment or chastisement on the murder charge. The zamindar now submitted a petition seeking for his release. The stalemate would have continued, but for an unforeseen event, a court martial. In his letter to the governor of Madras, the zamindar alleged that he had bribed Colonel, Colonel, Colonel Fletcher, the military officer who had entered the fort, 
He further alleged that the army officer had helped himself to the estate's treasury and shared it out with his troops after entering his fort. A military court was constituted to investigate the matter. The court martial pronounced that the company was not at war with Gumshur, hence time of peace prevailed. The officer had no right to treat the Gumshur treasury as war booty. The Zamindar's residence was not a fortified station. It was not taken by assault. The Zamindar was not a public enemy and was not declared to be in rebellion or outlawed. He was merely avoiding the process of justice. His property, therefore, the court said, was sacred and equally under the protection of law as that of any other British subject, close quote. This is a court martial. It called as the court martial then called the Zamindar to Madras to give evidence. The call was opportune. During his trip to the court martial court, the Zamindar engaged two European lawyers. When these lawyers requested permission to interview him formally, the magistrate of Chengalpet suspected that they were preparing to prosecute Colonel Fetcher and file a habeas petition in the Madras Supreme Court. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Go ahead, that's it. Uh, and so file a habeas petition in the, uh, in the Madras Supreme Court. And so he wrote, in the want of this writ being received, what cause am I to show to retain the person of the ex zamindar in my possession, close quote. The Madras government ordered the magistrate to disobey the Supreme Court. And uh, the government ordered him by saying, you are hereby prohibited from surrendering the ex zamindar of Gumsur to any authority without, whatsoever without express orders from the right honorable governor in council. The Madras governor then ordered all the lawyers seeking access to the zamindar should refer to the government directly. The preventive detention draft regulation was written five days later in Fort St. George, a matter I discerned by matching the letters, dates of the two documents because the files were not connected to each other. Debating justice. How did the debate between the colonial governance and imperial justice that led to Bengal 3, 1818 play out? The governor and council of Madras argued that it was necessary that the courts constituted to protect native subjects should interfere in matters concerning, should not interfere in matters concerning the safety of the state and its general interest. The judges of Madras re responded negatively. They held that the language of preventive detention was too loosely worded to form part of a law. Public interest warranted detention without legal conviction of crime only if there was evidence, they said, of disaffection. Preventive detention law was short of this evidence of disaffection. And I quote, the proposed law, they said, contains no definition of the crime for which individuals are declared liable to unlimited imprisonment at the discretion of the government. To incur the displeasure of the government is enough, and it is left to the ingenuity of police officers to multiply to a terrified population the causes by which the displeasure of the government might be excited, close quote. The Madras court argued that if this law were to be passed, it would expose men of rank and influence to be abridged of their liberty, close quote. Thus, the judge's concern was not the liberty of all their subjects. The, and so Bengal 1818 was short, despite this discussion, Bengal 1818 was passed shortly after and then has remained on the books of South Asian law ever since. The passing of Bengal 3, 1818 coincided with a remarkable parallel, the empire-wide turn to vagrancy laws to detain and police suspect populations. The parallel between mass detention on the basis of suspicion and preventive detention without charge is evident then in the company's criminal, archive, criminal law archive. In the 1820s, magistrates were empowered with expansive powers to seize persons based on suspicion, and these persons included vagrants, suspicious persons, persons without visible, visible means of honest livelihood and notorious bad characters, and commit them to the custody of a criminal judge. The judge could release them without or with security from those suspected, of a future offense, of a specific future offense, and uh, demand their good behavior and appearance in court. And the year that these vagrancy laws came into play, the Chengal Pet uh, collector reported that he had confined so many suspicious persons under the new regulations because so many fitted that description and more might require detention. So this parallel development suggests ways by which I think preventive detention was part of a wider production of anti-sociality. By connecting the emergence of Bengal 1818 to Bhumshar, what have I tried to do? So let me just try and wrap up by offering a few thoughts by way of a conclusion. I first began by considering writing and archiving in relation to the law and thought about its relation to the histories of justice. Historical amnesia, as Wisman has shown, is produced by disassociating the law from its archive. 
My effort to assemble a ghost dossier of preventive detention tried to work against the way in which archival taxonomies reflect territorial security maps. Gumshur got lost in some ways between the wheels of regional and national history. A Bengal law, Bengal 318.18, to create an imperial form of internal governance actually appears to have been substantially developed in Madras and about a military household in a forested borderland of both Calcutta and Madras, I mean, Bengal and Madras. The loss of the story has meant that Gumshur, an agency area, was deleted from the legal history of global and, of global and theoretical significance. Second, Gumshu's connection with preventive detention, when examined through the lens of abduction and unjust custody, played out between the household and the government is also, I found quite interesting, you know, working through that aspect. Doing so, I think, uh, you know, I felt that I could not, help me not reiterate the language of disturbed areas, which inscribed, which is inscribed on Gumshu by the logic of colonial security. Rather than Gumshu's disturbed nature, I tried to show that state abduction was legalized as a response to the proliferation of the adversarial trial, a hybrid legal tradition practiced in which Muslim law officers had an important role and who accepted the right to rebellion and rejected capital punishment, and a robust popular imaginary that opposed unjust detention without trial. The company could not claim, therefore, a monopoly on violence or justice, or even claim to be sovereign. The foundations of internal government then came up in a highly variated political system and were laid, these foundations were laid by legitimizing state abduction. Third, following Pratiksha Bakshi's call to depart from taking a very legally, legal centrist approach, I tried to map abduction and unjust custody as they circulated across state and non-state domains as a kind of dialectic. I've been, we've been slow to recognize this, I think, partly because I think we have focused on preventive detention's application rather than its formulation. Um, preventive detention drew on familial abduction by using the language of the disturbance of peace. And at its core, I think it was an effort to forge a negotiation or a patriarchal compact with heads of household, house, households to secure their allegiance. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, you see this kind of constant capacity and the desire of the East India Company to secure the allegiance of heads of households. But then also you see that this capacity was tested again and again by understandings of unjust custody. The coding of custody as public law could imperil the claims of imperial authority from time to time. Zamindars would liberate company detainees, popular upsurge against unjust detention would reach a certain threshold as it did in the early 20th century and in the 1940s with the AK Gopalan case. It was successful in places, moments, when it was able to create a shared meaning of the antisocial, the predator, the hill raider, the criminal vagrant, the communist. Finally, what can Gumshur and the early preventive detention archive teach us about security laws in general? The company's preoccupation with allegiance also reveals a preoccupation with reputation and image. It stemmed from its lack of legal claim to rule India and its investments in justifying British rule as the rule of strangers, as righteous strangers. This made the company and the imperial state, and I think even successor national states, very sensitive to image politics, reputation, defacement, as a sign of calibrating allegiance. In response to the preventive detention case in the 1830s, and I found this document, I was quite you know, taken with it, the Madras government argued that the, that the body of the people that it governed should not be allowed to suppose that there was an equal or superior authority to government. The moral influence of a contrary state of things, the moral influence of an alternative, they felt, would weaken the government authority by bringing, into, bringing it into disrepute, and this would hazard the safety of British rule itself. The history I have tried to outline today, therefore, is a contained one, but I hope to have outlined some of the logics of internal security laws that might, um, I hope, speak to a wider set of archival repositories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bhavani. That was, uh, that had a passion and a charge that, uh, that you get when, you know, the work is really opening itself up to you. I can, we can see that in you and, uh, uh, so it was really, really um, the formulation that you offered us uh, to look at law in its moment of inception rather and formulation, as you said, instead of in its application, which is what we are often guilty of when we talk of the contemporary applications. And we, when we say that, oh, um, you know, sedition law has, is, is a colonial law, 
or when we say that land acquisition law is a colonial law, it's too packed. We need to really understand what it means to say that this has a colonial genealogy. And that's what you uh, gave us in its uh, both senses, in its actual reconstruction of the genealogy and the difficult process of its reconstruction, because a law is not a law until it's in some senses a contextual, right? So that was really great. I just wanted to, a bit before I open it up, just wanted you to say a little more, I think um, for the audience as a whole, uh, this very interesting argument that you make, you make this in your other work as well, the fact of, you know, custodial arrest as being practiced by both state and non-state actors by the prison system, but also the household. I really want you to open that up a little more for us. I also want you to tell us a little more on the, on what, how the idea of disaffection get, uh, uh, you know, that, that imaginaire of disaffection, because when you put all these laws, these parallel histories together of vagrancy laws, of debtor imprisonment laws, of, uh, you know, um, and preventive detention laws, uh, mass incar incarceration laws, you talk about um, the liminal figures of, uh, but also the head of the head of the household as as primary primary in, interlocutor of the sovereign state, the sovereign uh, uh, in charge of property and family, right? So these the various characters who have an anti so money apart from the sovereign householder, the others are an anti antisocials, as it were in, in your formulation too. So, so all the, this entire map in that, so the standard story of rebellious populations being picked up and put in jail is not exactly one story, as you are saying. So if you could tell us all these subjectivities and what does disaffection mean in terms of these subjects vis-a-vis -vis whom these diverse laws play out. So thank you. Thank you for the two excellent questions. Um, first, in terms of state and non-state, so why get interested in the household as a custodial space? Um, so I was actually inspired by uh, Nasir Hussain's uh, discussion of Javier's, where he discusses in that chapter, he calls it a kind of an anomaly, right? That a lot of these Javier's cases in the Calcutta Supreme Court at that time were primarily uh, filed around you know, runaway women and uh, primarily brought um, you know, the figure of the patriarch, the, the, the father figure into uh, the legal arena as the custodian, the rightful custodian of these women. Um, subsequently, uh, that, after that book was written, um, it, it was that this idea was picked up by a fantastic article written by uh, Priya Tangaraja and Pony Arise, who kind of applied that concept to look at the kind of a queer archive and to also look at the idea of the abducted women um, problem in, in the kind of legal arena. So um, I, I was kind of really inspired by that. Um, and so I began to really think about how in the early modern world, when you start looking at 18th century narratives, whether it's the Maratha or if uh, or various other you know polities that are in formation at that time, uh, taking and receiving hostages was very much part of a part of the, you know, the everyday give and take of political alliance building. Um, and it was actually something that was equally practiced by households because household heads had powers, legal powers over uh, women, over their concubines, over slave girls, and certainly their servants and so on. Um, and so I started realizing that actually this practice of abduction was very, very varied and quite widespread uh, and quite normal. I was also struck that in the contemporary context, um, you know, uh, private, uh, this uh, question of non-state custody is a kind of feature that uh, colonial law, I mean, pr present day law courts have to kind of deal with a lot. So I began to kind of put those two sort of practices together and I thought, okay, you know, so here you have a kind of conflict over jurisdiction um, between Gumshar and the magistrate. The magistrate is allowed to enter the Gumshar household only when a murder charge has been filed, the murder of women, um, and the custody 
of the, you know, who has custody over the woman's body becomes a kind of point of entry to ask the Gumsha Zaminda to appear before the court of law. Um, lots of people have thought about this, so I'm not the first, but I do think that it's interesting that that becomes the premise for the whole detention of the Gumsha Zaminda to play itself out. And I think there we have a sort of conceptual connection between the mimesis, between the abduction of in the private, what we could think of as a non-state sphere, I won't say private sphere, non-state sphere, and the uh, practices of a state that is trying to become a public authority. And there is a kind of conflict, right? There's a conflict between the state, the East India Company state, it's trying to set up a government, it's trying to set up a sarkar. It has to do these abductions. It sort of is mimicking what is going on around it, but finds itself confronted by this other issue as well, how much, how do, how much can you abduct as a sovereign? You know, can, can you be a sovereign and be an abductor? And this is the contradiction that's being worked out in the preventive detention law in some ways. Um, as to the second question, heads of the household. I mean, I didn't have time to go into it uh, in very detail in the reading of Patel's speech uh, for preventive detention. But one of the ways in which he uh, legitimized uh, preventive detention in 1950 uh, was that he said, you know, I'm not against uh, Indian communism as an ideology, but I am uh, concerned about anti-socials, uh, you know, making trouble. And so I thought, isn't this interesting that in 1950, you get this kind of language of anti-sociality um, that resonates so much with this you know, the archive that I was looking at in 1820s, 1830s. And then I began to sort of piece it piece together that, that the imperial, the colonial state at this time that I was writing about was embarking on this project to set up a kind of compact with household heads. Mm -hmm. And the bargaining with the household heads, which you heard in this discussion with Gumshar, and you heard in the anxiety of the Madras court, about preventive detention was that you wanted some kind of uh, shared ground. The British government wanted shared ground between themselves and property holders and heads of households, right? And so this, the preventive detention was a kind of a negotiation of that, of that compact. And it worked insofar as um, the heads of households um, were able to support the policing of antisocials. So as long as you got a convergence around that, it worked. But it doesn't, it's not a comp, so it's a compact, it's not a contract. So it, it does have this kind of fragility, it does kind of fall apart. And when you read Patel's speech, you kind of come away thinking, well, maybe this was another invitation, um, you know, uh, in 1950 to heads of households um, to, to kind of to describe a shared imagination of the antisocial. Right? Thank you, Brett. So the floor is now open to questions and comments. Just as a brief uh, uh, question on, if I heard you right, it's as much the duration that's at stake than the act itself. So it seems like much of this is about how long can you keep them rather than absolute can you keep them so is that is that the case and how how do you keep them and let them go uh, with security so good behavior if you get a good behavior certificate and uh, uh, ask for security and they're let off or do you actually keep them indefinitely so when Bengal 3, 1818 is issued, the idea is that this person is such a notorious disturber of peace that he has to be put away, they have to be put away indefinitely. So the duration is calibrated to that magisterial police power because the magistrate is allowed to, to take people and let them go if they give a good behavior agreement. Does that become an issue uh, in terms of a debate around what is an appropriate duration for whom? It becomes an issue to the degree that uh, in, the, in, the, in the early 19th century, the magistrate usually writes 
that this person is so notorious, we need to put him put them away indefinitely. Um, and then during the 1857 uh, revolt, um, I, and I'm not 100% sure of this, but I think this is the case, magistrates were allowed a fair amount of leeway to seize people and detain them when and if necessary. So, you know, 1818, uh, Regulation 1818 has this kind of, uh, it sort of mutates into different things once it's on the books. And so after 1857, it sort of mutates into various forms of policing, frontier policing and so on, where the capacity to detain people indefinitely becomes another tool uh, for maintaining, you know, frontiers or boundaries or um, uh, policing when you know, various spaces. Uh, I found in the Madras presidency that Regulation 3, 1818 is imposed almost district by district in the areas where there were rebellions going on in the Sarkar, in the Northern Sarkar. So I don't think the duration was, I think it, there, was a, there was an effort to maintain a distinction, but I don't think the question of indefinite detention, um, once the law was passed, once the debate was over, um, I haven't seen too much evidence of a pushback from the judicial courts. Um, what you do see is that later on uh, uh, in 1870 and so on, you do see common law judges picking this up and talking about this as an affront to liberalism and you know the liberty of imperial subjects. Thank you, uh, Bhavani. I had uh, two questions. Uh, uh, one is this ghostly, uh, you know, you started with this thing and you just let it there. Yeah. Now, uh, this 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 phantom subject of the law, yeah. which is not normatively written down, but affects the way repetition happens, practices yeah. happen. So it's a very powerful argument, which a government crystallizes, but you make it into a more expansive format, yeah. by, by which I mean, uh, there are moments in which a so-called agency area, a border region, sets up the atmosphere mm -hmm. and moves something that later becomes the law, mm -hmm. right? So uh, uh, let's talk more about this in legal, you know, the history of law uh, scenario. So in medieval, in 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 medieval uh, practices, mm -hmm. you know, war making is also linked to ransoming yeah. and letting go. So is there a prehistory of yes. modern bail? Yes. Uh, for example, in, in, when, when in the reconquest in Spain, uh, children and, and uh, you know, people, subjects were sold into domestic slavery and they could ransom themselves out of, through a process of law, right? So similar practices existed in India during war making. Now in non-war making, quote unquote, which is quote unquote, the frame of modern law, how does, how do you, how does the form of release happen? Yeah. through a monetary transaction when it's yeah. a kind of yeah so that is very important yeah. in the preventive detention format i'm not talking of normal common law crimes and uh, the second is the relationship of what is the status of the defendant and a defense lawyer i mean you you know it, it does prevent the preventive detention of the colonized mean that you do not have access to legal speech so that is because the landlord is different. So the class character, these two questions yeah. are what I had. Yeah. Very nice uh, question. So the ghost dossier. Um, so I was interested in kind of playing with this idea of the ghost dossier for two reasons. One is that I think the it's important to acknowledge at every step in the way that the state version of this history doesn't want to acknowledge the messy um, you know, paperwork and discussions that preceded the formulation of this law, right? So at a very literal level, the ghost dossier indexes that idea. Um, I also think that the, uh, for me, what, you know, what is really important is that the law gets formulated in an atmosphere and then gets picked up and then reiterated in different formats. And what's interesting about that reiteration is that it, it still takes with it certain forms that were of detention that were already available and then reformulated for the state with it, right? So it's almost traveling through time, carrying all this stuff with it. And I was trying to find a, um, a kind of a, a, a conceptual term that would allow me to explore that. 
um, without necessarily getting caught in you know tradition continuity you know rupture uh, and change and i felt like that the ghost dossier did that for me and it seemed to me that every um law that i've been trying to study treason sedition you know each of these uh, comes with its own kind of ghost dossier uh, it's not there. You, if you look at the, you know, the earliest drafts of the Indian Penal Code, you know, Section 124, 121, and so on, you won't see it there. You'll have to kind of dig in a very, very different way into the archival scene to even pull it out. Um, and so I think that's where I was, that's where I'm kind of coming from. And that's something that, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that doesn't seem to be a primary um, concern of the state of exception sort of framework, right? Because the state of exception framework is trying to identify um, sort of sovereign speech as you know as the kind of foundation of laws violence and it seemed to me here although you do see rule by difference and you do see the racialization of population what you don't see is a monopoly on sovereignty by the east india company in fact the condition is exactly the opposite so that was the kind of conceptual sort of challenge um, for me um, the second question is about um, I think your question was, you know, ransom and war making, ransom as part of war making, which um, that's absolutely right. And you have to remember 18th century war was endemic in peninsula and actually all of the subcontinent. Um, there were sort of vast mobilizations of military landlords, military lords, um, service communities, uh, auxiliary troops. So you know, the whole uh, subcontinent in some sense was a looked very different uh, prior to the enforced sedentarization and prior to the, the property vision that was then, you know, laid out in, over the 19th century. Um, and in that time, um, a ransom and abduction were extremely common. And what was interesting about those moments that I could see from the 1780s and 90s, which I looked at, is that it it sort of centers around credit. So on payment, you could kind of, if you could mobilize credit, uh, or if the person who had abducted you was very much in debt, um, and then you could then put pressure on that person to let the abductee go. And this is something that is definitely, uh, you can see hints of that uh, in Mysore, in the, during the Mysore conflict, in the Maratha wars, uh, you see it, in dispersed ways, uh, you see it uh, as far up as uh, Rajasthan. Um, people are sort of taking hostages, receiving hostages, and uh, it's it's part of a credit arrangement. So I, I so I for, formally I don't know. So was there bail? I don't know. Sorry, I don't know. Sorry. How did the company, which yeah. is involved with these para para military, yeah. How did they justify this uh, in, medi in, in, in medieval law? Yeah. There are there are formats that you yeah. follow of 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 ransoming. Yeah. You know, you yeah. know how how prisoners are let go. Yes. There are you know in yes. medieval European formats. Even yes. here there are conventions of. Yes. You know, how yes. does when when you have this European power coming in, yeah. working with yeah. paramilitary forms yeah. and having these legal. Yeah. How did that work out? So I don't I don't have a sense of how they partake in it. Um, sort of earlier on, and I'm sure they must have, right? We, I, I just don't know the answer to that question. But what we do see is that this idea of ransoming and abduction, um, although this was endemic and happening all the time, is a challenge to your capacity to be a good sovereign. Because if you're, it's a, it's a fine line. Because if you end up violating the conventions around what is a good, justified detention versus an unjustified detention, you could be very vulnerable in some ways. And you have a situation where the East India Company could not even secure its jail, right? It would constantly detain people and people would come and rescue their associates. So there were jailbreaks happening. So you had to, you know, you're managing several things at the same time. In fact, the Indian Penal Code, one of the things they discussed was what do you do with runaway prisoners, right? So. <laughs> Uh, I think the first question is tied to uh, what Ravi was asking. The idea yeah. of the surety yeah. or the guarantor, 
Yeah. You know, who's going to take guarantee that this person is not going to be anti-social henceforth? Yeah. I think that's an interesting one. Uh, and the other thing is just a comment that, you know, while you were talking about the exchange of people, I could see that there was some kind of a mode, a transformation in the mode of exchange, right? From yeah. pastoral power to juridical yeah. power and the yeah. constitutive violence of the law yeah. becomes the social basis for sovereignty. But what yeah. you added was very interesting. That it's not just the social contract, but also the social compact through which yeah. sovereignty gets uh you know congealed yeah in yeah. in the yeah. modes in which yeah. uh society is organized and social relations are organized so i think i'd be interested in that if you have anything more to say yeah um what was, yeah, the first question was about uh, the first one was on uh bail surety yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, who's I, going to take care of yeah. this preventive detail yeah so just as a kind of comment on your first question which is that this taking of surety and you know, taking the surety of people of respectable rank is, you know, part of, as, as I was just discussing, it's part of the conventions of, you know, even early modern, you know, Indian polities across. There's no difference in that sense. What's interesting about the East India Company's capacity to appropriate that is that it makes it a kind of magisterial power of public peace. And so the constant uh, effort is to make the magistrate the person to whom the surety has to be given by people of rank and to make in his person the kind of uh, embodied uh, sovereign figure of the East India Company. So then you have to ask yourself, what does it mean to talk sovereignty when it's a magistrate, right? And the thing that you find again and again is that these security laws are becoming laws that magistrates can use. Um, you know, they're given a lot of discretion to do so. So that's what's, I think, a bit different about the 19th century from uh, you know, other contexts that we might know the, of, of India. The second thing about the household, I mean, the compact with the household comes across in a variety of different indirect ways. Because in a way, to directly say that I'm having a compact with the zamindar would sort of destroy the whole plan, right? And so you have to sort of read it almost, you have to imagine it as a aspect of the ghost dossier, um, something that is kind of there in the gray area, in the shadow, but not quite explicitly written out or, or proclaimed um, but it is without it the the piece of paper that you're reading in the archive probably would not have had uh, much traction um, I had a question uh, when you were talking about that there was this um, question of legitimacy, which would be a problem when, uh, if we are to distinguish the sovereign from the uh, abductor, mm. uh, or how are we to distinguish uh, the ruler from a robber? Yes, uh, it's a question of legitimacy. But, mm. uh, but uh, what constituted state offense in the sense yeah. that you? The regulation yeah. three of 1818 was uh, about state mm -hmm. prisoners, but with the company as a governing power and with the question of sovereignty being, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a debated question, I mean, yeah. debated point because uh, the company was constantly in, uh, in trouble to define what would be allegiance to it. Yes. So this is reflected even in the note on state offenses in the yes. draft of IPC in 1837, yes. that we, we didn't have, a, I mean, who, who is a British subject? What would be yes. disaffection? Uh, because the question of sovereignty itself was so, yes. uh, Yes, uh, yes. I mean, undefined. Yes. yes so, uh, yeah. how do you? So, thank you for that. That's a really uh, interesting comment, and uh, I agree with you in the sense that the state offense was not actually defined at all. It was not. They weren't able to define it. Um, the best example of this comes from uh, the 1790s, the Law of Treason, when um, they said, you know, any kind of offense against the state because they could not define what treason was, including armed robbery, murder, um, you know, any kind of heinous crime uh, could be state offense. And there are two reasons for this, I think. One is, as you point out, um, the East India companies did not have, was not a kind of 
legally it could not claim to be sovereign. And one of the dilemmas for the IPC uh, writers was if you do make a treason law, then would you be not violating um, you know, British sovereignty? And then what would be the status of the East India Company in that context, right? Or would you, would you be able to do so even if we were in a way um, uh, bearing allegiance to the Mughal um, sovereign at, at a formal level? Um, but there's another aspect of this, which is that um, in the Adalat courts, substantively the definition of treason, rebellion, and so on was getting defined by the application of Hanafi uh, Islamic law concepts by Hanafi practitioners, Hanafi experts. And um, some of the incredible uh, challenges that the company faced was actually because when these fatwas were written and it was on the basis of the fatwa that the sentence would be given, the East India Company could not actually, um, yeah, actually, you know, put forward the kinds of rulings that it wished. And so this question of what is a state offense becomes very much caught in this. So they could not, in fact, find a good correlate for treason, for example. And they had to consistently engage with the term Bhagavat, uh, which is not, in fact, punishable by death. And so, you know, so that was a, it was a very interesting sort of uh, internal, I wouldn't even say internal, because it's such a widely linguistically um, varied sort of courtroom. In con uh, connotation as treason. Correct. And, uh, and the fact that you're talking about the Hanafi jurisprudence, uh, that it that there was no offense as such which could be punished yeah. by death, yeah. uh, they took recourse to another form, which is that of siyasat okay. or hukumat, right. and uh, and discretionary form of rule to be yes, exercised right. under siyasat. That's right. Instead of the uh, Sharia That's law. Right. That's right. Uh, so it's it's interesting if we kind of try to yeah. again uh, look look at look it in back, that yeah. in that transition yeah. i think the question that poses conceptually is then what what is the basis of modern state sovereignty in south asia right if it is indeed these kinds of laws which are primarily uh, then dispensed to magistrates uh, as a way to uh, not just kind of widen the purview of policing but also as a way to um, not violate the terms of allegiance that the East India Company owed to its sovereigns, um, then what is, the, what is the status of the sovereign state, I think? And then why does defacement of the sovereign or disrepute become such an enduring preoccupation? The, you know, the performance of allegiance then becomes uh, heightened, right, almost. Okay. I think it's fine. Uh, I just picking up a little bit from the earlier question was, and what you said about when you read out AK, uh, uh, Patel's speech, uh, just thinking about like earlier, like even in this compact, what you were talking about, there seems to be a distinction between the rebel and the antisocial, yes, right? Yes. But when you look at, when we hear Patel speaking, it yes. seems like that distinction is done away with. And being a rebel and being an antisocial is like portrayed as the same That's thing. right. So that's just right. thinking about that transition. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's, that's actually a very uh, insightful comment because in fact, there is a kind of consistent blurring that you see in the language of policing which uh, comes up again and again. And in a way, um, you know, I, I didn't really respond to your question about, okay, what is the difference between a, a person on the social margins and a person uh, such as the zamindar or the head of household who's then subject to uh, detention. And, you know, the interesting thing, when I looked at a lot of the regulation uh, 1818 uh, orders that were given in the Northern Sarkars after 1818, um, they were seen as influential rebels. So these are men of influence, right? They are men of political influence, so not men of rank 
and social character, but men of political influence who have the capacity to foment disaffection among populations and they need to be separated from their populations. Right? They need to be separated from their home populations. Therefore, they need to be retained and taken elsewhere. And in this context, what was fascinating was to see this logic play out in the 1950s in the AK Gopalan case as well. So the uh, breaking of communication between the person of political influence and their followers was a key uh, sort of interruption that the Regulation 3 uh, preventive detention laws were trying to do. So there is a kind of communicative aspect. Now you can communicate violently in the sense that you can be an armed rebel and you can have armed followers and you can communicate by speech. And then the question is, you know, what is, uh, you know, is that rebellion or is that not, right? That's a big kind of legal question. That transmutes into fomenting public disaffection, so freedom of speech, freedom of expression, what we see playing out today. Yeah, let me just uh, look around once. Is there other questions that I hands that I cannot see? Yes, please go ahead. Just wait for the mic to reach you, though. Okay, we'll come come to the screen person after this. Thank you so much for the uh, brilliant presentation. I really liked it. And I also liked how you were moving across and drawing from uh, different time frames as also, also uh, I mean, different uh, zooming in and zooming out from uh, temporal spaces as well. Uh, my question was related to the comment that you made uh, regarding the connection between vagrancy laws as well as Bengal uh, Regulation uh, 31818. I was also wondering, was there any sort of similar uh, connection between uh, the Criminal Tribe Act, which came in 1871, mm -hmm. uh, and were there also similar sort of uh, assumptions behind having introduced such a law? Yeah. Thanks. That's a nice question. I mean, I haven't looked into the 1870s stuff in much detail, but let me quickly say that, you know, Regulation 3, 1818 mutates, right? So one of the things that's um, that I found about it is that it gets um, imposed on areas. So they will say regulations, we were using regulation 3, 1818 in these districts of the Northern Sarkars. And this was already in place by the 1840s. Anand Rup Sen, who's a, a scholar of uh, uh, Northeastern India has written a very nice essay recently on the use of regulation 3, 1818 in the uh, conquest of the Northeast and especially on the policing of frontiers. So from that, we can see that the, uh, the kind of, uh, you know, there is a kind of broad field within which uh, of, of containing populations within which this regulation does get applied. Um, so it starts off as this kind of detention of a zamindar, but it morphs into a, um, other things and it's used for a, 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 a accomplishing a variety of police functions, shall we say. Next. Yes, please. Let me Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that very interesting paper. And um, I just wanted to ask a sort of a question about method. Um, and, uh, you know, this goes back to the last question about how you use different time frames to connect these two, uh, these two moments in, uh, in, in the law and in history. So, uh, you know, so the argument you've you know, beautifully articulated, but I sort of want to think about the work that goes before you make the argument. And given that we're talking about the building of this ghost dossier, which is decontextualized, how, what are the archival steps that allowed you to connect Ghumsar to, uh, to the Bengal regulation, right? Because you, 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 you talk a lot about the connection itself, but how were you able to make that connection, right? And I'm thinking as a legal historian here, so... No, no, she said once, she said there was something, there was a little note that, yeah. To avoid archival fever. <laughs> yes. You can't, you can't. And, and then, sorry, then the other thing is, so connected to that, so I guess I'm asking you about, you know, about, uh, about how you actually, what, the, what was the work before you did, made these arguments? 
And the other thing is when you think about these sort of sorts of connected histories, so much of it about the formulation, the translation, the, the, the reiteration of of, of the law, a lot of it, uh, as we know, is you know is is it tends to be global and comparative. So I wondered, are you then thinking about uh, a different kind of mapping as far as legal history is concerned? Those are two big questions. Let me say you can't avoid archive. <laughs> it's it was very hard, and that's why this book hasn't been written because I was beset by doubt. Uh, when you go into a state archive, you're subject to its power. And you are, in some senses, wrestling with all these ghosts um, and trying to make sense of this pile of dead paper in front of you. And it's not going to let you do so because the, the indexes, the idea that you're sitting in a Madras archive thinking about Bengal, I mean, these are all, you know, from the archival point of view, somewhat heretical. Um, I would like to say in response to Aparna's question, which is that the law also remembers, right? And it remembers through precedent and it remembers through citation. It remembers through um, the creation of these, you know, uh, abstracts of judgments, the law reports. So the law does have an archive and there is a kind of corpus body of corpus jura, you know, the body of law then is always engaging with those texts and those citations. What was interesting to me is that these, the events and the files that I was interested in made a very peripheral appearance uh, in that sort of official law archive, if you want to call it that. These things are not cited. They don't have precedental value. These were not test cases, right? These were not reported on. Um, and so, I mean, I wouldn't say blanketly everything, but a significant portion of this archive is sort of submerged which is why this idea of the ghost became sort of important because for me, as a, almost as a literal sort of method to carve out this alternative reading that the law's own memory did not want to admit. I think that's the closest I can say. In terms of how I did it, I actually spent a lot of time looking at the Bengal proceedings <laughs> and not finding, not finding it because you often, you keep looking for regulation. I mean, other scholars I'm sure in the room who've looked for it, you keep finding the manuscript version of the printed regulation. At the most, you might find a draft with you know, revenue cut out or something like that. So it's highly frustrating. Um, and so it actually began to cohere for me when I found the debate. And I was wondering, why is this debate appearing now in Madras when the regulation was in Bengal? And then that debate seemed to be disconnected from Gumsur. But then I just sat, I mean, if you want to literally know, I sat with that darn judicial index in 1818 and I just looked through <laughs> every file because I felt, okay, it had to come I mean, by sheer common sense, if something passes in April 1818, maybe two years before that, three years accounting for mail delays. So I just sat and I looked at every index entry, um, which had state prisoners, detention, and I went down many, many false rabbit holes. And then finally, when I did connect, I connected with the dates. And so it is a tenuous ghost dossier, right? It is tenuous. And so I think I, I, I should emphasize that it could be, you know, Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. Uh, but I have to go with, with the feeling that the, the dates um, do actually connect um, the, 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 the conversation that the archive doesn't want you to have gets connected in the dates. We really should uh, let the person on screen who has, oh, there are a number of. Uh, oh gosh, I can't hear, I, I can't, can't see. Read. I'll read it for you. Uh, just about, uh, because I just made a progressive lens. <laughs> the first is from Dipali Kher. Uh, thank you for such a wonderful research. Uh, the question is in context of Patel's assertion as antisocial. And then the question is not there though. Anyway, the next one is at the outset. Oh, okay, so sorry. Uh, just, just, but we, uh, it's a webinar, right? Can she speak? No, she. Okay. Yeah. No, Hello, Dipali. Hello. Sorry for making you wait. Go ahead. Oh, no. uh, so basically, my question is is in the context where you ended that uh, in Patel's uh, speech, when he make reference to anti-social and anti-communal, uh, 
so uh, do you see the, how do you see basically uh, the element of nationalism because in the present context if we try to see security laws the prevent preventive detention is one of the major area so i am specifically asking this question that how do you read patel speech with this two element anti social anti communal uh, and the element of nationalism because uh, in 1953 uh, sheikh abdullah was arrested under preventive detention and it becomes the major moment defining relation between india and jammu kashmir okay thank you dipali uh, if in in interest of time can we take two or three together uh can we go back to the yes the next question is that uh, uh she liked your uh, uh, annavaram sorry liked your uh, presentation how do we understand the dialectics of interpretation within colonial judiciary yeah. the contradiction between court martial and magisterial court for example and the next uh, is oh lots of them i'm uh, I'm sorry, I can't figure out the name. Parnisha. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm really struck by the my messes, as you say, but between heads of household and colonial state, at a time of uncertain sovereignty, it can it becomes a genealogy of the Home Department, which is one of the longest surviving administrative departments of the state. That's interesting. Uh, colonial and post-colonial. the home department which is as we know has under it police functions later uh, in that internal administration a kind of oikonomia keeping the household in order it presents as you say a conceptual kinship yeah thank you that's a, that's an interesting formulation and uh, is there other questions below the police radhika has a question uh is abduction the removal from one legitimate source of authority to an illegitimate one oh. yeah that's great and hostage taking as an act of war is the regulation 3 of 1818 18 being treated as a ur regulation for all other preventive detention laws mm. chronologically this wouldn't for instance mm. work for vagrancy laws in in india which we can trace back earlier yeah and simona in your work sorry i think you should answer and then we'll take the rest okay uh, so hold on simona we'll just take your question after thank you that was a great uh, very good distant reading <laughs> okay so let me uh, quickly take the patel question right which is that dipali uh, uh, i'm not sure exactly what the question was trying to pinpoint the way i understand it is that patel was trying to argue that he was not anti communist not anti communal but anti communist and he did not want to he did not he was very careful to say that he was not a partisan he was not being ideologically partisan by putting out the preventive detention uh, bill rather he was trying to um, uh, curtail anti social anti socials right so for me what's interesting about that is the way in which the anti social becomes a kind of common ground to justify a security law that abri that abridges or at best diminishes the constitutional right to um uh, liberty of person and movement so i think that's i think i'll stop there and uh, i'm not quite sure about what you intended by discussing this kind of question of nationalism but of course the nas the national question is ever present in the i mean the constitutional assembly is in fact about creating a, a constitution for a new nation state right and uh, to me what's interesting then is then the way in which the language of empire comes through the language of imperial law comes through uh, not just in terms of a straightforward continuity uh but rather in terms of the reiteration of this compact with the new citizens of india that we both understand what anti social is so let's lock them up i think that's what was interesting to me reading the patel speech after um looking at the early colonial archive um the second question uh which is about colonial the sort of the different types of justices that are available in the colonial legal system there are a variety um and i think military courts have not been given their due in some ways um because we have seen them primarily as um courts that pertain to the army and courts that were 
had jurisdiction over soldiers, and that is indeed the case. But you also have the proliferation of military jurisdictions in the early colonial period. And certainly the imposition of martial law was a very regular affair. And what was interesting about this, and I discussed this in the book, is that the martial law did not mean the suspension of all law. It did not mean that the courts were closed. It would be imposed on particular taluks or districts, right? And so people caught, what it basically meant is that people caught when martial law was declared would be tried by a military process, by a court martial. And here's the interesting thing about early colonial court martials. Many people who are on those court martial committees, depending on whether it was a native court martial or a European court martial, you had uh, Indian sepoys, so Indian soldiers, who were often on these um, court martial um, panels. They were native court martials. So you can you know, think about a okay, case, so there's a whole bunch of mediation translation of concepts going on um, there as well. Um, Panisha's question, uh, that's a really fantastic question to kind of identify the idea of the home ministry as one in which um, uh, the idea of the police, the idea of internal government and uh, economy is being kind of constantly um, uh, renegotiated and then reiterated. And in some senses, uh, Panisha, I do see the security laws as being a as the kind of ground upon which the home is set up uh, of the state. Um, then I have a question about Radhika's question about abduction, um, whether abduction meant that if somebody was abducted, it would mean um, a, a kind of a movement of that from a legal, sovereign, a legitimate state to an illegitimate state. The answer is no, right? Because it was so much a part of war making um, and it was so much a part of the negotiations around various forms of surety, credit. Um, ransom um, and so on uh, no um, what it does happen is the this idea of you know the the person who does the abduction uh, is under stress if if they want to be a sovereign like the east india company the, or have a legitimate government then they have to be able to justify the abduction and that becomes a a really tricky uh, field for uh, sarkars to um, to navigate but I did have, I did see evidence of uh, Maratha Sardars and so on, you know, engaging and keeping particularly their subordinates under uh, detention for long periods of time till ransom and so on were given. So I don't think it has a, I don't think we can look at it in terms of legitimate and illegitimate um, um, in, the, in, the, in, a, in a very straightforward way. Okay, finally, the question on hostages and vagrant law. Um, and whether one preceded the other, the answer is no. And I don't think we should look for an origin, or originary law, because what is what is clear to me is when I looked at the martial law, the sedition, the treason, and then what I presented today, the preventive detention, you can look at scheduled areas, disturbed areas. These are all happening in relationship to each other. So there is a whole kind of ecology of, or a web of security laws that are coming up in relationship to each other. And I think working out the connections between them is perhaps more relevant than figuring out which is the orig original kind of law. If there is a reoccurring theme, it is that um, treason in a way is an undecidable crime in this archive. You know, it is very difficult for the law to op opinionate on treason, to convict people about treason, to um, even put away people, um, you know, punish them with death for treason, which is the kind of expected act of sovereignty. That is not, that fails. I mean, that doesn't actually not fail. It never comes to be. And um, I think that's the, that's for me, the kind of, uh, the kind of flashpoint around which we might see uh, all these different laws connecting with each other, coming up in relation to each other. Great, thanks. I just have the other uh, questions. Uh, go uh, go down below. I think we uh, Simon us and or, or scroll down a bit more. Uh, oh, that's just people leaving. Oh, she's gone. Okay. In your work, do you also develop the defense of preventive detention in the 1950s, not only by Patel but by many others? including Ambedkar, yeah, with no. the figure of the abducted woman. Right. That's a great question. Uh, I don't engage with it as a, uh, as a kind of, I haven't done research on it, but of course I'm, I, I use a lot of the scholarship on abducted women and the problem that abducted women posed uh, to the Constituent Assembly 
um, yeah, uh, Veena Das, for, for instance, has written about that. So I do use that work, but uh, I don't directly comment uh, comment on it. My primary archive is this is is the one uh, prior to the I would say actually 1840. So kind of prior to the uh, creation of the Indian Penal Code in some ways. Thank you. Do you have any other question, Ayodha, on the screen? I don't see. Oh my. Ah, uh, Shailaja. Uh, the manner in which the movement of the body being catalogued by East India Company is fascinating. What is the implication for how there's a shift in what is regarded as normative and outlier exception? And what does it mean for a shift in what you are saying in what are right stroke crimes in this period? The body, the cataloging of the body. Yeah. Uh, let me see if there are other questions. Radhika has a ref, uh, something to say about Parnisha's question about home department. Uh, yeah. Is this under the home department or the foreign? I think maybe that's a comment to Radhika. <laughs> I think that's a question for Parnisha. I think it's so far away from It's just a query kind of thing. So you're using security laws. Uh, so, I mean, and you're putting entire set of laws under security laws. So any particular reason why you're using security laws for that? For the, for the as opposed to state prisoners or state offenses? No. So, it seems all detention laws in your framework comes under security laws. Uh, so constantly you invoking the idea of security yeah. laws. Yeah. Uh, so since when and who started using security? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because it will connote a certain. Yeah. And uh, there's reference in 1791 charter also about detention. Yeah. Did you get something on that also? I'd be interested to uh, talk to you more about the 1791 because I didn't get too much on that. So I'd be interested to hear more about that. Uh, yeah, no, and we can talk about this. Some of this is, you know, just uh, talking to each other and figuring out that something exists and then hopefully the archive fever leads to something, you know. Um, so this question of security is interesting. I mulled over this a lot. Like, should I be using this? Should I be just using state offenses? Should I be using political crimes? Um, or political trials. Um, and I came to the conclusion I want to go with security laws because at every uh, juncture in the archive, you get the language of public peace, peace and tranquility, uh, security, um, you know, um, securitizing behavior, uh, trying to, uh, in a way, stabilize an unstable context. Uh, trying to ensure that people are bound to the magistrate and that their behavior wouldn't would be more predictable in some ways. So in so I figured I should try and you know dig into that aspect of the uh, of the of the of these documents. Um, and the second reason is that I was reading Richard Wellesley, who was the Governor General at the time, that the first uh, treason laws were uh, set up in Bengal and then in Madras. And in his correspondence, he frequently mentions uh, the term, um, this is required for our security, this is required for the, for the security of the British Empire and this kind of wiping out of the British Empire by you know, treasonous rebels and so on. It's a very kind of uh, 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 very important uh, uh, kind of trope for in, uh, Wellesley's work. So in, in that sense, I'm responding to the, the words that are being used. Um, I would say that, you know, tranquility, public tranquility, uh, public peace, these are words that are being used. Um, for me, the idea of security allows me a little bit of play between the past and the present. And it signals the kind of police aspect of these laws. Um, so I think that's the reason why I decided to go, to go for it. <laughs> 
as a as a kind of conceptual tool to talk about state prisoners, state offenses, political trials. Oh, um, I'm trying to remember the question. Let's try to ask. Uh, transition. Right? Uh, yeah, I mean, also how the cataloging of the imprisoned bodies and whether uh, who is being prevented and how is being slaughtered. Yeah. So, um, so that's an interesting question. That is to say, the uh, and it goes back to Ravi's question that the person who's been preventively detained is a person of influence. So they are not being subjected to the scrutiny that we see is being, you know, extended into the populations that are being surveilled, right? And this Radhika has written about extensively in a wonderful way. So they are not cataloged in quite the same way. There is a language of, the language of abduction in this context is really about negotiation and compelling a certain kind of allegiance with a person of influence, right? So, um, so I think the cataloging of the body that we might see in, say, kind of the Criminal Tribes Act and so on, or even in the vagrancy police registers and so on, you don't see that in the preventive detention logs that I've seen. What you do see, of course, is their, um, is their, um, their influence being detailed. So the, the, it's their reputation, right? Because now you have to think, this is the state that's being worried about the disrepute that it's bringing upon itself, or the disrepute others are bringing to it. And so it, this is really about, you know, who's more influential, like who's influential and who do we have to control in order for our authority to not fall into disrepute. So that's the, that's the kind of dynamic at play. Uh, and in terms of what becomes a crime and is there something normative building out of this? Um, I think it's coming out of this, as I say, a kind of a crisis around allegiance. You don't, you have to, you're constantly calibrating allegiance. And so um, any, it, in that sense, it's a widening up of all kinds of behaviors that can potentially be uh, thought of as, um, you know, antisocial. Uh, and then of course, as we know from the late 19th century, seditious speech becomes one of the important aspects of this. Um, and that transition is a mid 19th century transition. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, you, you, you really took every question generously. And you actually clarified something right at the end when you said that there may actually be two parallel communicating with each other. Genealogy is one of mass incarceration of populations, okay. vagrants, frontier people, tribes, and so. And the detention of exemplary figures who can create disaffection from Gopalan to the Gumshar Raja, right? So that's the story that she's saying. Thank you very much for being so generously uh, responding to all questions. Uh, and so, and thank you and come soon again. And we are going to see the book now it appears in very soon. I hope so. <laughs> thank you.